Thank you for the introduction and thank you to everyone for, for taking the time to attend. There's obviously a lot to talk about when it comes to cloud and transformation. And there's also a lot of buzzwords going around. So what I'm going to try today is uh, cut through some of the buzz and actually share how cloud and transformation innovation actually really fit together. So I am an enterprise strategist for them Amazon Web Services. And if you, as you heard in the introduction, what that really means is that I have spent most of my time on the on the consuming side of IT, right? Whether it's public sector at the Singapore government, you know, large commercial uh, organizations, you know, like Allianz, large worldwide insurance company, spend a lot of time in professional service and also spend times in startup organizations uh, and Silicon Valley on top of that. So I've seen like technology from most every possible angle. Um, I meet a lot of interesting people, have a lot of interesting conversations with our strategic customers. So I like to write about those. So I'm also the author of a book called The Software Architect Elevator, which is actually really a book about transformation. It's about the role of architects in a transformation scenario. And then of course, close to home, I wrote a book about cloud strategy, right? How do you make sense out of all those, those moving parts and all those pieces, right? So when we talk about cloud, right, there's a million different aspects like AWS alone has more than 200 production services. So it's always good to start with the, the simple premises, right? In the end, from a technical perspective, cloud changes the way we interact with our IT, right? It used to be very much on you know, physical servers, physical compute, you go to IT, I need something. Maybe they had some virtualization, but often they have to order and purchase hardware. And I've been very much part of that IT. We had whole teams doing hardware sizing, right? Um, they long lead cycles, right? Contract negotiations with the hardware vendors. Yeah, many of these things were like routine for our IT infrastructure. Now, of course, cloud has changed that dramatically, right? Everything is at your fingertips. And that is not just about you know, servers and virtual machines, but for anything else you can imagine you want to have in your IT environment, whether it's a database, an API gateway, a load balancer, router, a machine learning model, a data warehouse, right? Everything basically can be created with a push of a button or an API call, right? And that also means you no longer just file a ticket to get something done, right? This is very much self-service and like we like to highlight also a shared responsibility, right? If you want to build a resilient solution on the cloud, that certainly can be done. And we have many great examples, but that also takes some architectural best practices, right? And we get you off sort of these long investment cycles, right? The depreciation, hardware updates, all these kind of things that gave a lot of headaches to IT planning cycles in the past, right? It's pay as you go pricing. You don't deal with any, any of that. We take care of all those complexities for you. Now, what is important, right, that traditional IT was mostly looking at infrastructure, IT right? provision a server, a computer, maybe a hardware storage, maybe some database, but it was basically all infrastructure. And as I alluded to before, the cloud is actually much more than just infrastructure, right? We will see how application delivery is actually the key element that cloud computing brings that in the end carries the business value. So this is just a recap, I right? probably known to most, right? Sort of the big before and after from, let's say largely the technical side. But what's been amazing over the last decade in a half, right? We launched Amazon Web Services in 2006, right? So what has happened in that time is that people have found an enormous breadth of business use cases where this shift is beneficial. Right, and the, the obvious one and still very good one is of course cost reductions, right? Because better economies of scale or better utilization of the hardware, but it also ranges all the way to agility and productivity, right? And in a world with a high degree of uncertainty, agility is actually very important, right? And productivity is equally important. Your cost basis is one part, but what you're getting for that cost of productivity you're getting out of the folks you have, right? Is at least as important. It used to be in the early days that people were unsure about security in the cloud that has actually come full circle. People realize that in today's threat environment, you know, as a cloud provider, we have the sufficient scale to do things that are just simply not possible on premises. Right? Where there's ranges from having custom hardware in our architectures to having insight into global traffic patterns, things that are very difficult to replicate on premises. So in the end now folks actually migrate to the cloud 
because they see it as better security and it's relatively easy to see that it also gives you best better operational resilience right you have availability zones you have multiple global data centers there's a lot of things that you can do in the cloud right there's more pragmatic drivers you know like end of life of hardware um on-premises data center contracts that respire that expire uh, entry into new markets right where it would take a long time to procure new data center and equip all that in the cloud you can do that so the nice thing that we find is that through this technical enabler in the end the business benefits that our customers achieve are actually very, very diverse. And I think that's a little bit of the, the magic of cloud computing, right? And this is clear then, right? And there's board level discussions, right? It often starts with cost, but it shouldn't end with cost, right? Again, productivity, a lot of our customers are, you know, the skill sets constraint, right? It's hard to find people these days. The business often is going well. So making best use out of the folks you have is a big deal and we can help a lot with that. Nobody wants to pay for IT that isn't running. So operational resilience is key. And then I come back to the agility, which will be the theme for our transformation. And of course we have great examples and you know, hundreds and actually thousands and thousands of case studies where we actually achieved results on all these different dimensions. What I wanna to do today though is zoom out a little bit and say, why has this been such a big deal? Like why is everybody talking about cloud computing? Yeah, it's nice to get a server more quickly. It's nice you also have a database, but it seems all good. But why has this been such a big powerful force for transformation? And I think in order to appreciate that, it's helpful to zoom out one level and see how the role of IT has fundamentally changed. Now, when I was the chief architect, we are a very large insurance company, many billion, actually multiple billion euros IT budget. We spent the money very wisely. We did many amazing things. But what I always said we did is we made essentially digital copies. We would take something that the business would do anyway, and we made it better, right? We made it more accurate, faster, more repeatable, more efficient, right? I was in insurance, so whether these are risk calculations, right? Monte Carlo simulations, whether it's compliance reporting, whether it's um, notifications of lost payments, renewals, refunds, right? All the things we did in IT are things that the company would have done over 100 years ago, right? In this case, there was a 130 year old business, right? All the things I just mentioned, the company would have done. And of course we made them much better, but in the end we copied something the business would have done anyway. And that made us important, but you can see on this structure and there's two ways of being important. The one is being critical to the business. And that is very clear without IT, nothing would work, right? We just wouldn't be able to run a, a business without IT far too inefficient, but we weren't as big a differentiator in the early days, right? And that was the big transformation at Allianz and many of our other customers was about to not just make a digital copy of what would already be done anyway, but to see how the digital technology allows us to think and work in a fundamentally different way. One of my favorite examples, right? So on my age group, I grew up with cassette tapes, right? Little tapes, you stick in a tape layer to listen to the music. Now somebody came with digital technologies right? called the compact disc. I'm sure you guys remember, right? And it was better, right? Higher quality, more durable, right? Had longer play times, right? Many, many things. It was just simply better. But admittedly, that was a digital copy. You still needed the player. You have the thing, right? Instead of rectangle, it was round. You put it in, you could listen to your music. It essentially placed something analog with the digital copy. Now, the thing that wasn't a digital copy is streaming, right? The Spotify's of this world, right? Uh, the Amazon Primes, right? That is not a digital copy. That fundamentally changed the model. There is nothing to buy. There's nothing to own. There's no device to put anything in. You have a million songs at your fingertips, right? There's subscription models, like everything fundamentally changed. So the new role of IT is to no longer make digital copies, but to find ways that fundamentally change the way we engage with our customers. So think streaming, not CDs. Now, the reason that is important is because this idea of making digital copies is baked deeply into IT's operating model, right? I'm sure most of you guys who work in large organizations, right? You know how anything gets done in IT, right? You make a business case, you get a budget approval, and then you start a project, right? And based on that project, that project comes to an end, right? And then things go back to 
business as usual. And that's how we managed our multi-billion euros, actually worked reasonably well. However, it is based on two important assumptions. The first assumption is you have a good idea of what you're going to build and the benefit you're going to achieve. And that works well for digital copies, but it doesn't work well if you try something new. And the second assumption is that change is temporary. You can package your change into a project and we even had change in run organizations. Some part of the organization dealt with change and the other part of the organization didn't really have to de deal with change. Now, in the world that doesn't make digital copies anymore, both assumptions are no longer true. Deinnovating and finding new business cases. Well, how do you know which one is great and the benefit you're going to achieve? The honest answer is you're not sure. You have some good ideas, you have hypotheses, right? But ultimately you're experimenting, right? So now the business case is harder to make and you can't expect your first experiment to be the absolute home run. So you're experimenting continuously, right? So change has become constant. So this is a big difference, right? I call this the difference between economies of scale. You do something, you do it more efficiently, and the bigger you are, right, the more return on investment you get versus now it's economies of speed. We are trying new things, and the faster you can learn and get feedback, the more successful you will be, right? The left-hand side favors scale, the right-hand side favors speed. Cloud brings speed, if I give a tip here. Now, to underline that this is not a wordplay, right? This is not me yes, to, to be funny, right? It's a massive shift is we find that our customers on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, they use a different language. And a language is a very important reflection of the yeah, cultural way of thinking. So here we see a different language. Now, this is the language on the left-hand side, the economies of scale. People speak in absolutes. You know, they they speak in project budgets, right? I need 20 headcount, I need a million dollars, it's an 80 month horizon, here's my business case, I will cover the cost in three years, right? And I need to buy hardware for $200,000, right? And here's my business case, here's my use case that I'm gonna implement, right? It's all in absolutes. Now the folks in the economies of speed, they're always you know, changing direction, they're experimenting, they're looking for feedback. So these absolute values aren't as meaningful for them. So they speak in relatives, they speak in rates. The mathematicians would say they speak in the first derivative, right? So they talk about burn rate. How much does this project cost per month or per quarter? How much business value can it deliver per iteration or agile sprint? And they don't buy hardware for $200,000, right? They get it from us in the cloud for a dollar an hour because they think in a consumption-based model. And rather than trying to think about the absolute perfect use case, they think about cost of experimentation. How much does one attempt actually cost us and how can I bring this cost out? Now, it's a little surprise to find that all the folks on the right-hand side operate in the cloud because the cloud speaks the language of the economies of speed. The cloud is a consumption-based model. It speaks in the derivative. And this shows why cloud is such a great fit for the right-hand side. Provisioning a server quickly is certainly nice and reducing the TCO is great. But this is where the real big shift is, and this is why we're talking about transformation. It's a different way of working. It's an agile way of working, right? It's a consumption and iteration base of working, and it fundamentally impacts the way the IT works. Now, as we've seen, cloud can do many amazing things. And I always try to, to bring it uh, down to basic terms for our customers. Why is this so powerful, right? What is the amazing thing? that cloud can really do for your organization. Yeah, I've thought about this quite a lot. And in the end, I came to, to the point that the most powerful thing this technology does is that it removes constraints. And removing constraints is actually an amazingly good thing because if you look at a classic CIO agenda, uh, like an IT executive, IT leader, they always live on this spectrum. Right. On one hand, and this is especially true for large organizations, if there's group initiatives, right, it's always harmonization, complexity re uh, reduction, cost reduction. Right? Make things more the same, make them less expensive, make them less complicated. Guarantee you on every CIO's agenda, that's it. And then comes the business and says, well, we need to compete in different markets, right? We need to be innovative, right? We have digital disruptors, right? We need a one-off over here, we need to be flexible. And this constraint of having to choose between left and right makes most CEOs life actually pretty tough. It's a tough job. Now at Amazon, we, we like to ask questions. And one of our favorite questions is why? Like, why does this have to be left or right? 
Well, in the end, the answer, yeah, is rather difficult. Simple. The answer is because you have constraints, right? And these constraints come in two flavors, right? One is technical constraints. Maybe you can just work in certain ways. And there's mental constraints, right? There's certain assumptions, ways of working. Now we can take care on a lot of the technical constraints. And I will give some examples. There's amazing things that the cloud can do. That's an old on-premises technology you just simply couldn't do because of levels of automation and scale and many other factors. Right, and there's also mental constraints. We also help with that. That's why we're having a session like today that talks about transformation, right? That is about changing the way of thinking and the assumptions you can make. And the amazing thing is, so let's take one of these examples, quality and speed. You know, IT has often learned that if I move more quickly, right, I have to compromise quality, right? That's why we do things quick and dirty. Like, why can't we do them quick and clean? The next year when I worked at Allianz, one of my key slogans was fast and compliant, right? I build things that are fast but compliant with our policies. They're not quick and dirty. So when you put speed and quality on two different axes, you can now have a whole different discussion. It's no longer about where on this curve my dot is, but I can talk about, can I shift the curve? Right. And it actually turns out, right, in some cases, you can even invert the curve where moving faster actually improves your quality. Right. And I have many examples where this is possible. Right. Speed and quality is the classic one. And the key enabler here is high degrees of automation. Right. If your software is compiled automatically, all the tests run automatically, it's deployed automatically, your infrastructure is um, set up on configured automatically, you eliminate most sources of error because most sources of error in this is us. Right? People just make mistakes. We're not very good at repeatable stuff. We're very good at dreaming up new business cases and ideas and functionality. That is great. And we should use that to be an agile business, but we're not very good at these repeatable things, nor is it a very productive way to do it. So automating all that makes things faster, obviously, and it makes them higher quality. Standards and innovation is a classic one. It's like, oh, the standards constrain me, right? How can I be innovative? Well, we at AWS know a thing or two about that because we run a very standardized platform, right? It is a scale business in the end. We sometimes call it the hyperscalers, right? And we are the largest of them where we have the best scale. But the reason we can do this is because we have a common platform for all the customers. Now, at the same time, so the blunt way to put this sometimes is, right, when I talk to customers, I say, you're getting the same AWS that your competitor is getting, right? It's a common platform. There is no other way of saying this. However, look at what innovation booster this has been, right? It's been the biggest change in IT in the last decade and a half, and it's like increased the rate of innovation just more than any of us would have believed. So there we have it, right? Something is very standardized, but it enables innovation. That is the magic of platforms, right? And there's many of these more, right? Maybe the last one I highlight, sharing and monetization. People always think they have to keep things secret to make money of it. We have a thriving open source community. There's billions of dollars of valuations of company that essentially operate open source products. Right? Of course, they do this with operational support and many other things, right? But they have shown that you can be very, very open, but you can still monetize. And this is the thing we like the most, right? Where we take these things where you had to pick left or right, and there was a lot of you know, aching and maneuvering and where should we be? And we say like, look, you can have eat your cake and have it too. We can give you actually more things. And this is one of the reasons that cloud is such a big deal. Now, of course, right? You're not the only ones who are interested in this. Like, oh, this is great, right? I also want to do this, right? I want to remove constraints. I want to have higher productivity. I want to have agility. I want to use these cloud services. And the answer is yes, you should. And the answer is yes, you can. And yes, we have many, many examples where this has been extremely successful. The answer is also, there's a few things to keep in mind along this journey, right? Transformation is serious business. Transformation is Latin, right? It kind of means like to change the shape, to change the form. So we're not putting new paint on the house, right? We're taking the two-story home apart and build it back as a bungalow, right? And that gives you an idea that this is serious business, can be done, right? But it's not something that you, know, you just sort of do by the push of a button, right? That's why we are here um, to, to help you. So the first message I want to give is I have too many customers who say, I want to be like, Silicon Valley company XYZ of my business, right? I want to be the Amazon of banking. I want to be the, the Apple of this. I want to be the Microsoft of this, whatever you name it, right? The Facebook of that. That is not what your transformation should be about. A, culture and transformation is not a copy-paste exercise. You 
shouldn't we? I mean, we're a great organization, but we shouldn't copy everything we do, right? We're in a different business. We are happy to help you, but in the end, your transformation purpose should be to maximize the return on the assets you have because you have many assets, right? You have existing products, you have brand, you have IP, you have people, you have ideas, you have market share, right? That should all be amplified, not to just like copy something completely different that somebody else has done. So this is important set number one. Now we have, it gets tricky, right? Is when we see how we can apply these new technologies. We say, we can see that they bring us a lot of change, but history has taught us that these transformative technologies like cloud computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, IoT, all the stuff that, that we bring, right? That it takes time to understand how they impact your business, right? And it's great to look at history, like you know, steam engines, water wheels, etc. You see time and again that people first replaced one piece with the other, right? The factories had big steam engines with a lot of pulleys and belts and all sorts of stuff. And then people would want put one big electric motor and the electric motor would also drive the same pulleys and, and, and engines and shafts and all that kind of stuff, right? They're like, okay, it's cleaner, safer, more efficient, we feel good, but it's a digital copy if you wish, an electric copy in this case. Then people realized, oh, these motors, we can actually much smaller. We can put these in tools, right? We can put this everywhere. We can automate. And then, of course, the notion of the hand tool came. Oh, I can actually put this in something that somebody can hold. So rather than having this giant machine I need to put anything, I can have a hand tool. I can have remote control car. Like the whole explosion of innovation actually happened, right? And this is the same thing we advise to our customers. You really get the potential in the second and the third step. The first step will look nice. Right, but the second or third part, right, where you reconfigure and reimagine, that's where you're going to get the big boost. Unfortunately, sometimes we see the opposite happening. And here's an example. This is from the, from the UK, sort of like 1800s. These are the examples where you have transformative technology, but the reconfiguration and the reimagination hasn't happened. And right? this is called the locomotive acts in those days. And the way those works, they prescribe that in front of every self-propelled vehicle, there needs to be a person waving a red flag. And of course, the people in the self-propelled vehicle were going very fast. They were not realizing the potential of the transformative technology. Now, what has happened here is that this law made sense originally when a self-propelled vehicle was essentially a steam engine on wheels. They were large and dangerous and hot and noisy and giant. Nobody wanted to be anywhere near. So this law made sense. Now the transformative technology comes along, right? If you follow the same old processes, right? You're not getting the potential out of this. Now we do see this in IT, right? This looks like where we can provision and server for you in a few seconds, but the organization still has a two week approval process attached to it. That is unfortunately the same thing as waving the red flag. And unfortunately that won't take you to the cloud, right? You more likely get a new data center. Now we have very nice data centers, but I have not met one IT executive who's out to get another data center. So you need to change the way of working on thinking to really harness the potential of this new technology. Now there are a lot of success stories where people have done this, right? We work a lot of banks, like digital bank startups across many different industries, utilities, right? Many, many examples how this has really changed the way people do business. And there's one risk in this stuff. And yeah, that's why I always want to be transparent. From the outside, they always look like there was a giant leap, right? They were a very traditional business. They had a mainframe, right? And then it's boom, right? Now they have everything in the cloud, in containers, serverless, machine learning, artificial intelligence. They have APIs for the customer. They have open data, right? And you're like, wow, this is really impressive. What you need to keep in mind is this is never a single giant leap. It's always an iterative process. It's a learning and refining process, right? And here's an example that I took out of, you know, machine learning and data science, right? People, you know, operate on a certain amount of data. They use machine learning against the data. They can make better predictions, provide better customer service. So that way they get better customers. They can justify collecting more data and that way they have more data. So what they have done is they found what we at Amazon call a flywheel. They found a positive feedback cycle, something that supports itself. What the Amazon marketplace, right? If you have more selection, you get more buyers, right? You get more buyers, you get more, more merchants on the marketplace, you get better economies of scale, you can lower your cost basis, right? It's a flywheel, a positive feedback cycle. So these transformations happen by 
finding flywheels, not by making one giant leap here to there. Now, as you can see in the picture, there's one important ingredient is the flywheel also needs a starter motor. It needs something to get the wheel going. And oddly, that little starter motor often doesn't have such a good looking business case because the business case is in the wheel spinning. So what sometimes happens is very unfortunate, right? You have an organization that looks like a car with a very powerful engine and the tank is full of gas, but the battery is empty. And people said like, oh, the battery doesn't have a great business case because I can't drive my car with this little electric motor. So there's a danger you need to understand. The little electric motor starts the big engine right? and the big engine is the one that gets you going down the highway, right? That actually fires up your innovation engine. So it's never a big leap, right? And be careful, you will need a starter motor, right? And the starter motor's potential is much, much bigger than the initial business case, I see. Well, and since my, my sort of words of warning here, right? About transformations like that go really well, but also where we, we caution folks to watch out for. I work with a lot of regulated industries, right? I come out of the insurance business. I work with a lot of banks, financial industries, utilities, right? We're regulated. And just like with the red flag, we're regulated for good reasons. There's always been an original objective, right? I work with public sector law. There's always been a good original objective. Now, what has happened, that objective has been translated into certain mechanisms and implementations, either processes, procedures, technologies. It has been translate it into something that fulfills this objective. Why? Right? Sounds good, right? That's why we have guidelines, quality gates, um, audits, right? All these things we have, right? And they're all good because they help us maintain those objectives, right? In the Singapore government, it was protect our citizens' data, spend taxpayer money wisely, right? And Allianz is also be compliant with Buffin, you know, many other things. So all the objectives were very, very good. Now, What's important to understand is that this translation has happened under certain constraints, right? There's things that you could do and things that you couldn't do. Now, somebody comes along with a disruptive technology. Like we just did, right, with cloud computing, right? Now, these constraints are removed. We just learned about it, right? You can move faster, higher quality. You can have standardization, but be more innovative, right? You can be more open and monetized, right? You can have short-term gains and long-term gains. Right? We saw the long list of things, of constraints that we can remove. So it's natural for you to want new mechanisms. Like, oh, great, I want to redefine these mechanisms. So the natural thing would be, let me take these mechanisms and processes and guidelines and let them adjust them. Let me adjust them to this cloud environment. That does not work. Right? Because this translation has already happened based on certain constraints. Right? So the best way to do this is go back to the objective. What did I want to achieve? Because now with much fewer constraints, I can do a very different translation. Give you a simple example, right? One of the mechanisms almost everybody has are audits, right? You have periodic audits. What's the objective of an audit, right? Of course, it's very clear. The objective is an audit is to assure that the actual process and procedures match the prescribed guidelines, right? Very, very common in almost every industry. Well, there's a constraint that factors into why folks do audits. And that constraint is that usually there's limited transparency. Like if you had full transparency, you wouldn't have to do periodic audits. You would see everything that's going on all the time. You don't need to go twice a year and look. Now, cloud computing actually does bring a lot more transparency into your IT, right? You want to know what application runs on which server, how much that server costs you, what Java service it talks to, when the last update was, right? Is it up to date? Is it secure? Like we can answer all these things in a fraction of a second. So your objective is as viable as before, but now you have a completely different mechanism. Now, if you try to take the shortcut, you say like, oh, maybe instead of doing the audit twice a year, I do the audit once a quarter. That wouldn't lead you to the transformation. You need to realize like, oh, I can make automated rules and guidelines and dashboards. I can build very different things to achieve my objective. So what might seem like a detour in the picture, going back to the starting point and retranslate, that in the end is the by far the most efficient way to get into the transformation. So that may be as, as one more piece of advice. So lastly, right, how do you get from here to there? So great things we can do, right? Like these transformations are amazing. There's a few things you need to keep in mind, right? So now we have our sites set on like, yeah, we want to be a digital cloud native kind of agile enterprise. And that is great. But those are your goals. Those are not your strategy. 
and I'm sometimes a little bit mean, I say, well, the goals, they're really more like wishes, right? These are things you would like to have, right? And that's great because wishes are free and they always sound really good. But what you need is a strategy, right? You need to have something that tells you how to get from here to there, right? If you notice, my book is called Cloud Strategy, a decision-based approach, right? The decisions are about making trade-offs, right? There are going to be forks in this road, right? And there's, you could have gone left and you went right for good reasons, right? And this is actually a big part of my job to help customers identify such strategies. What are the forks in the road? What are the benefits of going left? What are the benefits of going right? What is the best answer for you? It's not something you can copy paste from other folks because their constraints and their context is different. We find the best answer from you. So we have common frameworks, but we apply that to your situation. Right? The path you take, that is your actual strategy that gets you to the goal. Now, I have one last piece of advice. We talked about steam engines and stuff a little bit. Here's one more thing is when you're in this transformation, you of course have expectation that things will move more quickly and you'll be more efficient and more agile and you should because that's what the transformation will deliver. But it won't deliver by doing the same thing, just trying harder. Right? The transformation delivers because you work a different way. And it's just like the electric train and the steam train. If the electric train passes you, you're sometimes tempted to say like, you know what? I can also go faster, right? I put more coals in the fire. I put a bit more pressure on the boiler and look, my little steam engine goes another 10 or 15 kilometers an hour. Now, you know where this leads, right? This will not lead to any transformation of any kind, right? This will just lead to a burst boiler. And I share this because this can be very frustrating for your staff, right? I was in a similar situation. I was told, oh, do more with less because the digital companies can also do it, right? They can have a million customers and they have three people in operations, right? Why can you not do this? Now, if you forget that those guys don't run on coal and pressurized steam, right? That is a very dangerous exercise. You will burst the boiler. So I need to understand that people play by different rules of the game and understanding those rules, like the removing the constraints, for example, like rethinking the mechanisms you have. That's what allows you to work in the new ways of working, not simply by pushing harder. It's easy to fall into this trap, but it's actually a dangerous trap. Now, I talked a little bit about traps, but I think they're actually quite manageable, right? So the, the last caution I have here on this journey, complexity is probably your biggest enemy. If you look at past successful technical transformations, they usually made things simpler, right? I alluded to the steam engines before, all these flywheels and belts and pulleys and valves and pressure pipes and all that kind of dangerous stuff, right? The electric motor ultimately made this go away. Now, to be fair, it didn't make all of it go away, but the stuff that it couldn't make go away, it made the utility. Well, just like cloud computing, right? You want to build, you know, globally distributed consistent databases, man, that's somewhat complex. You know what? We've done this for you. You just need to plug in to the socket and you have that available. So here, my word of caution, right? Along this transformation journey, don't try to rebuild things that the cloud already does for you, right? Sometimes customers say, oh, I want to have some sort of additional abstraction layer kind of things over top, like, that complexity is actually going to work against you. The magic of the cloud is that all the complexity sits underneath and you have a simple way of using it. So keep things simple. That's how most successful transformation have happened. They didn't make things more complex. They made things simpler, right? Cars, same example. And yet electric cars are simpler than combustion engine cars. They don't have gears, for example, right? They don't have gas tanks, right? They don't have um, fuel pumps, right? There's, a lot of things that electric cars actually don't, don't need, right? And that is the way these transformations happen. So I hope you enjoyed my, my view, right? A little bit about, you know, what is cloud computing technically, right? It's more than just getting servers quickly, but that in the end has a lot of benefits. You know, cost is, is the anchor, but that's the start, not the end, right? It's about productivity, it's about resilience, it's about security, it's about agility. Right, and the way you get there is by seeing that this technology can remove constraints, and well, that's amazing. Right, and the way you get there is through a transformation journey. Right, the transformation isn't fresh paint on the house. Right, you need to rethink how the way you work, and for that you need a strategy. You need to make some decisions and some trade-offs to get there, so you don't end up bursting the boiler. Now, 
At Amazon, we know a thing or two about innovation transformation. We started as an online bookstore. We are a lot more than an online bookstore today, right? So what we can bring to the table is an understanding that a successful transformation hinges on a combination of many factors, right? You need to have the right technology and the right architecture. That's how AWS was born, right? Because we needed something that supported the speed of our business. We like to have mechanisms, things that way we work. We have a very clear culture. Now, many of you have heard of the leadership principles, right? We like to be custom obsessed. We like to think big. We like to dive deep, right? That's the language of our leadership principles. And of course, the way we organize. Right? There's a lot of talks about two pizza teams and small teams, small agile, you know, independent, autonomous teams, right? This is, of course, the way we work. So, yeah, you know, here the offer that we're happy to bring that to the table as well, right? In the end, it's not just about technology, it's also about changing the way of thinking and working. And we're always happy to have that conversation, right? That's a big part of my role as well. So we can we can share what has worked for us and to understand that it's always the interplay of multiple factors. And it's not about making a giant leap, right? It's about finding those flywheel effects that ultimately propel you forward. So thank you for your attention so far. And I look forward to any any comments or questions you might have.